This conference will now be recorded. Okay. <laughs> So, um, study significance, uh, basically there's a lot of expansion, or there has been quite a bit of expansion in traditional faculty roles with the advent of online learning. There is not essentially a, a role that encompasses you know, lecture only in class face-to-face -face education modality anymore. There is almost always some sort of online or virtual component to a faculty member's workload. And so that has implications. Uh, especially when most faculty members are subject matter experts. They have not been formally prepared as educators necessarily. Now that is increasingly more popular with the MSNED and that kind of thing in nursing education, but outside of nursing and even sometimes within nursing, PhDs in nursing or other um, emphases does not provide uh, you know, formal training on learning theory and things of that nature. So. Um, data from this study will be useful for guiding uh, strategic timing and delivery of specific professional development content. We'll talk about uh, the discussion of findings. There are certain developmental plateaus uh, throughout the life of a career. Uh, this can also be a framework for policy development pertaining to, to faculty roles and responsibilities. It will also explore uh, the influence of external forces on uh, on uh, those that affect faculty priorities like release time, uh, recognition during tenure and promotion, pay, that sort of thing uh, when, when looking at online course development. So my theoretical framework is Banda's, or excuse me, Bandera's self-efficacy theory. The major assumption in that theory is that your personal beliefs about your capability to achieve a desired outcome is the most important determinant of your behavior. Obviously, that's key in motivation to deciding uh, which behaviors to engage in and how much perseverance or effort you will show in persevering through adverse circumstances. So within those major, that major assumption, there are two main concepts, outcome and efficacy expectations. Outcome expectation is your belief that a certain behavior will lead to a certain outcome. If I study really hard, I will get good grades. The, effic excuse me, the efficacy expectation is more a personal estimation of your ability to produce a desired outcome. Do I have what it takes to study uh, you know, those types of things to get the good grades? It's important to note in this theory that skill and incentive are not necessarily equal. Okay, So I may have great confidence that I can do something but not have the skill to actually achieve that. And vice versa, you know, I might have the skills to do something and then no incentive to engage in that behavior. So uh, they are not necessarily always equal. There has to be a balance between skill and incentive, obviously, in order to be successful. Bandura describes four sources of self-efficacy, and they are listed in order of strength, according to Bandura. Obviously, this may vary from individual to uh, individual, but the first of which is mastery expectations. Mastery expectations are successes, essentially. So if I have engaged in a behavior that was intimidating to me and I have uh, achieved success, that will reaffirm my belief in myself, essentially. And so that is a very powerful source of self-efficacy. Vicarious experiences are next. And vicarious experiences can be a powerful source of efficacy, but the the important uh, factor in the uh, vicarious experience is the, the parallel between the two individuals. I need to know that I am, you know, have the same characteristics, background, you know, education, those types of things in order for me to place great value in vicarious experiences. Verbal persuasion, but that is the third uh, most powerful source. And I don't think that needs really much um, description, but verbal persuasion, you know, you can do it. Um, that can also be um, helpful for bolstering someone's confidence. And then the last is emotional arousal. Sometimes people will get into a certain situation and they'll be nervous and that may reaffirm their belief that they cannot do something. Likewise, it can be an overwhelming sense of joy, you know, which reaffirms that they can do something. And so that will obviously affect that person's ability and uh, motivation to engage in that behavior in the future. Methodology for this study was uh, 
was a cross-sectional survey. I chose cross-sectional because I did not have the time and funds to do a larger longitudinal type of study. So uh, the tool that I used, the survey tool that I use is called the Online Teaching Self-Efficacy Inventory, and it was created by Kevin Gosson in 2009. It consists of 47 items, and all of the items are arranged on scales from zero equals no confidence, 10 equals complete confidence. And the handout there is uh, the definition of those subscales. So I will be referring to those frequently. My sampling method was is non-probability, uh, propulsive with a snowball element to it. All of the prospective participants received an email from me, a form email indicating uh, the title and nature of the study with a link to the survey, which took them to a Qualtrics database. Now, the link was the same for every participant, um, and that was something that I chose to do because it could be anonymized, essentially, within Qualtrics, and that scrubbed it of any IP addresses, any, you know, anything that would uh, be identifying factor for those participants. So I was essentially able to guarantee anonymity, barring someone breaking into Qualtrics with my password, and, you know, well, even then I wouldn't have I wouldn't have identifying information. So the population was approximately 3,600 uh, nurse educators from Iowa, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. That number was um, taken from the annual reports for each state from their boards of nursing. One thing that was a consideration was the fact that none of those boards of nursing actually delineated traditional nurse educators and online nurse educators, not a single one. So. Um, it was really kind of a fact shoot on, on the actual size of the population for this particular study. So uh, what I did was I went through each approved uh, list of nursing programs in, in each state and went to all of those school websites and looked at all of the faculty directories and was able to get 1,006 emails, email address. So, I shouldn't say that's 1,006 emails sent. That was, they were batched, so they were not 1,000 emails, but it went to 1,006 recipients. From that, I received 196 responses, which if you look at it in the context of 1,006, that's a 19.5% response rate. However, if you look at it in the context of 3,600, that's only a 5.73% response rate. So. In order to achieve statistical significance, um, I needed to have 348 responses, and that's with a 5% margin of error. Unfortunately, I did not achieve that. Uh, I did do a pilot of the, of the survey with um, a few nursing faculty, and that led to simple grammatical changes in the OTSEI. Obviously, the tool was approved and developed um, as is, and so I was not able to change any of the items or elements on the tool aside from the demographic data at the beginning. Analysis included um, regression and analysis of variance. So there are some statistical assumptions that must be met for bivariate or multivariate analysis, the first of which is that the data must be normally distributed. There must also be a linear relationship between the data of some sort. And then um, homoscedasticity or an equal amount of variance among all of the variables. So if one value is just as accurate as another. So variance must be equitably distributed. For regression, there is also another assumption, which is um, multicollinearity or the absence of. And I looked at that through three methods, uh, Pearson, uh, correlation coefficient, tolerance, and then variation inflation factor. Uh, none of the variables uh, had any sort of, or any rating of, of, of correlation greater than 0.2, which was necessary for the study. Anything less than 0 0.8 was acceptable. Uh, the analysis of variance, or ANOVA, was one way, and that just simply indicates the amount of factors that you have in the analysis. So there was only one independent variable. So ANOVA is a test of significant differences between groups. There, unfortunately, with ANOVA alone, does not show you, tell you the need of differences, and so I did post hoc uh, analysis with Tukey's honestly significant difference, and that gave me the nature of differences, which was important um, in, in my findings. So the first research question was, do the online teaching self-efficacy beliefs of nurse educators differ according to age? 
the short answer is no, not in this particular study. It was very interesting uh, in the in the beginning, one of the incentives for me, you know, going down this this path with research of this subject was because I thought that younger people had a greater affinity for technology, and that was simply not the case. There were no significant differences between the age groups, but it was interesting to me that those 65 and older had the highest mean score. Uh, so I stand corrected. So uh, I, I did think that was particularly interesting. Uh, even though the 22 to 34 range was last, they also had the greatest uh, standard deviation. So that's you know a fair amount of, of variation in that particular age group, which I also found to be interesting. Research question two, uh, do the online teaching self-efficacy beliefs of nurse educators differ according to years of teaching experience? I measured uh, total years of teaching experience in, or excuse me, teaching experience in total years of teaching experience, and then that specific to online education only. So within the total years of teaching experience, there was not a significant linear relationship between any of, between um, that in any of the subscale variables. <clears throat> So um, typically, your beta values need to be greater than 0 0.3, 0 0.4 uh, to indicate uh, at least a moderately strength, uh, excuse me, moderately, moderately strong relationship, and that was not the case here. So there were no uh, statistically significant linear relationships there. However, in the years of online teaching experience, <clears throat> analysis of variance was used and was able to identify significant differences in all five, excuse me, all five subscale variables. So after the post hoc analysis with two piece test, uh, I was able to find that the technology total and virtual total, which are the variables that were the sums of the each of the uh, subscales on the on the OTSCI, instead of taking each of the 47 elements independently. I summed all of the items per each scale and used that as my, my variables. So uh, tech total, which is the technology integration subscale and virtual interaction uh, subscale, all had significant differences that showed significant improvement in, uh, in scores, mean scores at zero to two years of online teaching experience, three to six, and then greater than 10. So there was a performance plateau in that particular, uh, those particular subscales essentially from six to 10 years. Migration or of course content migration also uh, was significant at the three to six year mark and then again at greater than 10. So again, this seems to be that six to 10 years plateau <laughs> performance there. Within the uh, online course alignment and web based course structure, there, there were uh, significance at zero to two years of experience and then greater than 10. So that is a pretty wide performance plateau and I'll discuss that here shortly. Research question three, uh, do the online teaching self-efficacy beliefs of nurse educators differ according to number of online courses designed? I measured online courses designed as number of online courses developed from scratch and those that were adapted from a traditional or face-to-face -face format to online. So within the number of online courses developed, ANOVA showed differences again in all five subscale variables. So with my post hoc analysis, uh, technology total showed frequent uh, development at four to six, up to 10 and greater than 10. Uh, virtual interaction and course alignment was at four to six and greater than 10. Web-based course structure had the most frequent intervals, essentially at each interval, of courses developed, zero to three courses, four to six, seven to 10, and greater than 10, and then course content migration had uh, greater than 10 courses developed, which is a very logical assumption that anybody who developed more than 10 courses is going to be um, significantly higher mean score than anybody else. So, And then courses adapted from online or from traditional to an online format, the uh, ANOVA revealed significant differences in the technology and web-based course structure subscales. And then with the uh, post hoc analysis, was able to look at the differences there and both scales varied identically in that they were significant only at four to six courses adapted. So there were some limitations to my study the first of which was uh, generalizability. 
the study was not uh, statistically significant. You know, size, I didn't hit my uh, number that I needed. And so it is difficult then to take my results and generalize them to the general nursing education population. It's also geographically limited. I only uh, looked at nurse educators in Iowa, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. The data collection period is also a limitation. I had to extend that. Part of uh, the extension was, I think in week three of four, that I had I planned four weeks of data collection. In week three, I still was nowhere near my 348 responses that I needed. And so Dr. Barnes, Dr. Sellergren, and I decided that we needed to apply for a project modification and extend the collection period for two weeks, which we did. However, that extended the data collection period into the summer break. And so I think that definitely affected the response rate um, <coughs> and the participants. So that was unfortunate. Another limitation is the use of ordinal level variables. Um, a lot of the demographic data was in ranges. So age ranges, courses developed ranges. None of it was in single increments, which precluded me from using regression analysis in all of those except for online or excuse me, teaching experience total. There was also some inconsistency in demographic data collection. Uh, the boards of nursing each, they all had different um, information that they collected. It wasn't consistent across the board, which you know, I found to be interesting um, because you know the, the National Council of State Boards of Nursing has so many standards for, in, for boards of nursing uh, nationwide, but data collection is not one of them. And so in my discussions with the Iowa Board of Nursing, Dr. Ray has indicated that that would be a good idea and is going to collect data on online nurse educators versus um, gender, or excuse me, uh, traditional nursing education in future, um, in future data collection periods. Another limitation was personal bias. I am an online nurse educator and so that could certainly influence my view and analysis of the data and um, interpretation of literature. So, uh, and then online students, were, you know, were these participants online students and does that affect their affinity and or confidence in an online classroom? So my discussion of findings. Uh, so basically this study extends the knowledge based on the OTSEI that has the studies that have been used, that have used that particular tool. And I was only able to locate um, one particular group of studies, um, and that was by Northcote and Goslin. Goslin created the tool, and Northcote was uh, the research partner. And so those particular studies just showed uh, mean scores at different um, points in time. They did longitudinal, but they did not examine uh, the variation in the mean scores over a certain time necessarily, or 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 identify performance plateaus. And so my study, hopefully as some literature in that uh, those performance plateaus can be used to uh, strategically time professional development for, for online nurse educators. So when our first uh, research question there was no, there was no significant differences between age groups and the OTSCI scores. And the fact that there was no findings in itself is significant because if that were the case, you know, Bandera tells us that human agency um, or behavior is a result of a model that he terms triadic reciprocal causation, which is a sort of dynamic interaction between personal characteristics, behavior, and environment. And so obviously that are, that's quite a bit of variation for each person. And if there had been significant differences, that would imply that professional development is the same for each year of experience or, or very similar for all online nurse educators, which really is not a logical assumption. So that was uh, significant, uh, or the absence of significant was significant for them. Uh, secondly, no significant linear relationship between the total years of teaching experience and the OTSEI scores. This could be indicative of the unique pedagogy for online instruction. Pedagogy was not a variable in this particular study, but it did come up in the literature as a source of concern for nurse educators. A lot of new nurse educators new to online instruction 
uh, stated that they spent a lot of time trying to figure out technology, navigation, LMS, those types of things, just the technical aspects or you know mechanics of, of online teaching, and they did not have time to consider wider issues uh, such as you know, pedagogy, institutional, uh, is, excuse me, institutional issues and student-centered issues. So again, uh, Bandura tells us that uh, that experience and uh, self-efficacy is generative over time and that uh, the more uh, sources of self-efficacy you experience that reaffirm your, um, your practice or your behavior will also, it will increase the likelihood that you're going to engage in, um, in a particular behavior. And so that simply was not the case with, uh, with teaching experience. However, in online teaching experience, there were multiple significant differences. And in, in some of the cases, uh, especially in the online teaching experience, there were specific performance plateaus uh, and or essentially uh, periods where the experience experience level or some scores flattened over time. And so that was particularly interesting in that in um, the technology and virtual interaction scales in the uh, online teaching, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, in online course development varied or fluctuated in identical patterns. And this could be um, reflective of the frequent development that focuses on foundational tech literacy. So typically institutions will have like an onboarding process for online educators that involves training that has to do with the LMS, you know, those types of things, the basic uh, foundational uh, concepts and characteristics of online teaching. And so that may be reflective of the frequent intervals of development of those particular areas in the subscales. Uh, <laughs> and that was, again, um, that was a literature review or a finding consistent with my literature review was that institutional trainings are typically based on technology and basic mechanics of online teaching. Course content migration, again, significant at three to six and greater than 10. So performance plateau of six to 10 years. And I think in this case, Bander is applicable because it's reasonable to assume that anybody doing something for a period of six years has sort of found a groove or, or a level of comfort with their practice and what they're doing. If it is successful, why change it? So there's no impetus to change there. They are, you know, it is less likely that a person is going to be motivated to change their practice. So they may not. And then um, online course alignment and web-based course structure, there was a performance plateau of two to eight years. And this was interesting because that is quite a long period of time. And again, going back to motivation to change your behavior is based on what are my negative consequences of not engaging in this behavior? What are the possible rewards for engaging in this behavior? And something that was interesting in the literature review was the fact that during um, the, when, when uh, instructors are passing out of the first couple years of their experience with online teaching, they become preoccupied with the tenure and promotion process at their institution. And so a lot of sources that I found did not um, put online course development and things of that nature in you know, the things that were considered for tenure and promotion, which is interesting. That is not something that, uh, that tenure committees found valuable, at least in the literature that I looked at. So obviously that's going to have an effect on the priority of those things uh, when you consider what is expected you know, and recognized in your tenure promotion process and then what is not. Obviously those that take priority are going to be um, of greater concern. So they did not see these areas as priority development. And I think this may indicate that uh, instructional design support or professional development in these particular areas uh, may alleviate some of the early tech-oriented concern and speed development of more complex skills, but that also tech, the, um, there are developmental needs that differ with experience and stage of your career. So again, Bander tells us that self-efficacy is generative and so um, is also reliant on mastery of skills at increasingly difficult uh, task levels. And so 
there is uh, not a priority to, to learn or engage in those experiences that are going to increase your skill uh, skill set, then not likely to do that. Uh, number four, multiple significant differences among uh, groups according to number of online courses developed and adapted. So this particular um, finding, I think, is is significant, obviously, because there were significant differences found. But I, I find this to be one of the more interesting uh, findings because this when considering online courses developed, this was when uh, development occurred or significant development occurred at most frequent intervals. So, you know, in the technology subscale, which was something that most uh, instructors view as a barrier to successful online teaching, um, they developed at four to six, seven to 10 and greater than 10. And so I think that that uh, um, frequent development is, is commensurate with the rapidly evolving technology and the fact that these instructors were engaged in course development from the ground up or choosing those technologies. They had to be intimately acquainted with what they were putting in their courses really spurred their development at a much more frequent interval than those that per se, you know, were, were taking a course and teaching that somebody else had developed. They did not have necessarily a, a say in virtual interaction and uh, online course alignment again was significant at four to six and greater than 10. So there was a plateau again between six and 10 courses, which might be reflective of the non-teaching role associated with course development. I know a lot of times people will develop a course and then teach it, but that's not always the case. So that could be you know, reflective again, of, you know, you're, de you're designing the online course, uh, but you're not necessarily engaging in teaching it while you're designing it. So those, that professional, or excuse me, that plateau would be indicative of the non-teaching role. Web-based course structure um, was actually frequently, or was, uh, excuse me, significantly improved at each interval. So zero to three courses, four to six, seven to 10, and greater than 10. And then uh, course content migration, again, was significant at greater than 10 courses, which again is a logical assumption um, because anything that you have done greater than 10 times is likely to be something that you're pretty adept at. Um, so again, I think overall that the frequent development of the respondents in this particular uh, sample was due to the quality of the professional development experience of developing online courses from scratch. So the um, adaption, um, the courses going from traditional to an online format, they varied um, in technology and web-based course structure at four to six courses developed. And again, I think that this may be um, the absence of findings here, again, is significant in the, um, the fact that most of the subscales really pertained to totally online courses necessarily, that the course content migration was a factor that almost was entirely separate from some of the the subscales in here. So of course, content migration was its own subscale and it was also its own variable in the study. So I think that that um, maybe confounded those results. So suggestions for future research, obviously to duplicate the study with a much larger population. I'd like to focus on some of the developmental plateaus that were um, identified, particularly in that six to 10 year range. Um, I'd like to explore the effects of instructional designer presence on online teaching efficacy. I think that one thing that was not accounted for in this study was did these respondents have any interaction with instructional designers? That, that was nowhere in the study and that data wasn't collected and so I think that could definitely be an influence especially in course development. Uh, if you are tasked with developing a course, I'm, I'm hoping at least that you would have some sort of um, instructional design support. Uh, that is not always the case, but um, it would certainly be uh, logical to to assume that. Explore a uh, relationship between online student experience and online teaching self-efficacy. If you are an online student, um, I've been an online student for three of my degrees now, and that I think certainly has familiarized me with the environment and most likely influenced my level of confidence and ability uh, to teach in that environment. And so I think that would be an interesting study as well. 
And lastly, I would not use ordinal level data. Again, at all. <laughs> Age ranges and ranges for courses. Uh, that precluded me again from doing um, regression. So there went my ability to predict, or at least um, to explore prediction of anything. So, and that was something that I uh, don't necessarily have an intelligent answer for, other than that the tool existed in that state, though there were ranges that it used, and so I just stuck with that. Um, however, if I were to do this study again, I would definitely not use ordinal level data. All right. Now the fun part. Questions? Well, I think we owe you a round of applause. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, good job. You did a really nice job with the presentation, you. You. and I think it's a you know clear explanation of what you did. I had, um, <clears throat> pardon me, I had just a few questions about uh, some of the things you identified as limitations. Yes. Um, one of the things that you talked about was your response rate and that you extended your period of data collection. How many, what was your process? I can't remember from your proposal. How many emails and reminders did you send? What was your process for sure. that? So uh, reminders were sent every two weeks. And so uh, with the um, extension or the project modification form, I sent them for that, uh, that last two week period, I sent them weekly. And so um, I, you know, I did see it, typically after each email, there was a little flurry of activity. Um, obviously that less, it was less and less towards the end because it extended into the summer break. But initially, you know, when I first deployed the survey, there was stuff coming in. I was excited and then it just kind of tapered off. So, and then I would send a reminder email and then it would have, you know, an uptick again. And then it tapered off. So, um, yeah, I, at, every time I sent a reminder email, there was a little bit of activity, but unfortunately not. And then the other question that I have is, you talked about your, um, you kind of briefly mentioned that you had done your pilot, mm -hmm. but you weren't able to change much except edits because of, and I just didn't catch what sure. you said about the right. pilot process and what you were able to change and why or what you, how you were limited there. Sure. So um, the OTSDI was, I, I, I received permission to use it as it was. And so I yeah, so I did not I was not able to change any of the subscale items. However, I did have permission obviously to change the demographic data that I collected. And so there were some uh, grammatical errors and things like that that were uh, discovered during uh, the pilot where the faculty were sort of looking at survey flow, presentation, and any obvious yeah grammatical errors that. Um, well, I mean, I think I, I, I want to talk a little bit just about, you know, your sample size. And I mean, obviously, you know, we've, we've been talking about this process for months. And I mean, I think any of us who have ever done, you know, survey research understand the frustration when you, you know, you think, oh, everybody will be happy to take this survey. I mean, I just use so much too. you know, I, I think, you know, granted, Really, the, the crux of the issue is not having a good understanding of the population of online nurse educators. I mean, so so through my lens of reading through the dissertation, I mean, I think, you know, to me, you know, a thousand participants seems reasonable within the larger population of what are 3,600 or so right. nursing educators across these three states. I mean, and I think. You know the, the next logical piece whether it's through the boards of nursing whether it's institutional how, however the nursing profession wants to really try to target mm -hmm. what is that particular population so i mean so i think yes obviously it, it's something you, you had to address you needed to address it but i mean i i personally don't view it as something that was overly derogatory towards the findings of your study dr whitaker also has similar comments when he reviewed us well. So, um, and that was, I think that was sort of reflective of maybe my level of disappointment that I didn't, you know, wasn't able to change the world of my dissertation. But I think that's also um, the fact that boards of nursing did not uh, identify differences, maybe reflective of their lack of awareness of, you know, 
the major differences in online education versus traditional. Uh, and I think, too, you know, something that I found in my literature review was the fact that um, nurse educators in general, uh, you know, said they found value in online education, but felt the need to control the content. So they really had a difficult time letting go um, and kind of embracing the whole online aspect of things. And so I think that maybe there may be a connection between uh, the lack of awareness and, you know, the true feelings about our value that they place on education. So this is the curse of getting your doctoral degree. So what are you going to do the next time you get an email with a survey link in it for another researcher? I filled out every single <laughs> survey that came to me. There were several. Yes. You, I filled you out survey, every one. You get survey guilt. I did, and I will continue this. I will to pay that forward many times. Yeah, I just, I mean, I think to identifying with other people that are going through this process, uh, the empathy, um, and uh, you definitely want to help someone else going through the same thing and you know and contributing to the well i think as a nurse and an educator it's my duty to contribute to the profession and the you know the body of knowledge that exists about it but it's also i think just a nice thing to do having been through the process myself yeah. I, have, I always i always have a question that's great but i i do think that we have to be found um, is, is an interesting unintended consequence of your study in that boards of nursing might find it interesting yeah. to collect that specific data, especially as education shifts, yeah. more simulation being brought in, sure. you know, how many online instructors do we have? Because I think there's always going to be a stigma attached to online education until more people uh, grow up with it, I guess, and that it's always looked at less than in, in some ways because it's different. So I think that you're finding that there is an inconsistency that and maybe not reporting it at all is something that some of the boards might start yeah and it really seemed like oh we just weren't aware we didn't think of that so it wasn't necessarily you know something they were intentionally doing or not doing it was right. I know that. But, and I, I, I've also had I, I was able to read your study but you know in hearing you present something that, that I jotted down while I was listening was uh, that, um, that interested me was kind of I noted here arrogance of youth and this is in response to your research question, too. It was the teaching experience question where you saw that bump mm -hmm. in that zero to two year range of people who are teaching. And comment on that. What do you think might, might be causing that bump? You know, I think that there may be some incongruity in between what somebody with their initial foray into online education that is youthful, um, I get Twitter and Facebook, you know, and all that. So they may feel overly confident with those particular types of technology and then get into it and be like, oh, that's not uh, that's not what we're working with here. So, you know, that I think the variation, the standard deviation that was like 117 or something, I don't know, I can't recall, but it was the greatest deviation, standard deviation. So there was quite a bit of variability. And so I think there's also a lot between zero and two years of experience. You know, there are so many things that you realize right away, you know, and that are reaffirmed just in that initial couple of years of experience. So I think there's a difference between two and zero, really, of years of experience. And I think that um, the fact that the probably did a little bit of that reality shock and realized that I just didn't really know well, that much. That's something that you would want to flush out, too, yeah. you know, because if you see a lot of people, and I know uh, that burn out in five years, you know, there's there's some faculty who are that you know that five-year time period oh, I want to move on and I may want to go back into practice because I can't handle this. Yes. That might be an area of focus and that why do you see that big standard deviation? So there might be those who come out I've got this red shiny degree and I know all the things and then others who are just absolutely terrified but that's just those are assumptions. I mean what is it about that group that where you didn't see so much variability? Right. I think there, you know, obviously the, the external influences and things like, you know, emphasis on tenure and promotion as somebody who's going through that process or coming up, you know, looking at the criteria, uh, there's nothing in there about online course development or anything virtual of any sort, which I find ironic, especially at the institution I work in, where about 4,000 of the 4,500 students are online. So, um, yeah, 
but I think that, you know, again, just it's a combination of things, you know, emphasis on, you know, your priority, what is valued in there. And then uh, there was also some literature findings that did support the fact that, you know, I'm a subject matter expert and I got into teaching and I just wasn't prepared for the teaching piece of that. I know all of the information but I don't know how to deliver that. They weren't familiar with pedagogy and, and things of that nature. And so that definitely, there was some um, element of, you know, I might consider leaving the profession. Um, that was not an area explored in depth at all in, in the literature review. It's not one that I found um, as a huge theme, but I do think it is definitely worthy of note and, and could be. Others of us have looked at similar type questions with our research. I mean, yeah. that was, you know, I looked at professional development mm -hmm. of, you know, really people transitioning into, you know, from professional practice into education and, and, and that pedagogical piece of it and how that shaped their identities. And I know Jackie did something similar. She did, I did a qualitative study. She did a quantitative study. And, you know, I, I think <laughs> another piece, and as you're presenting, I, I think, it, 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 this would be a really neat study, and you know, I, I really, I have to really think hard about how to design it. But I think if you could, if you could find several schools that that are predominantly online or have, you know, like an online BSN program or a hybrid where there's a lot of online teaching done, I'd really like to see what the correlation is between the self-efficacy of the online instructors versus what their NCLEX pass scores are, because I, I, I'd like to see. You know, if they if they really are struggling with that efficacy piece, I mean, you'd hypothesize that their NCLEX scores would would probably reflect that. Right, that that would be. And there's always that element, and there was there was a lot of that in the literature review. Does this affect student outcomes? Well, nobody really is able to. Right. You know that that would be a huge. It'd be huge. It'd, it'd be a big project. There, but it'd be a big it, project. It would be. It would be. Phenomenal. Very valuable information, yes. though, because I mean. So I look from from an administrative perspective. I mean, I think the, the piece that I take out of this is, you know, how can we, you know, we have limited funds that we can provide for professional development. So so really to get the most and the best use out of our investment in faculty professional development, what are the key areas that are going to provide the most benefit? I mean, I think obviously this is an area where we probably should be looking at, you know, investing into professional development to make sure that our online educators, and it's not, it's not just nursing, it's everybody. I mean, we have other online educators in here that are not nursing that, that would absolutely benefit from, you know, really especially where, where you identified where the plateaus were. I, I thought that was extremely helpful. I went right to, we, have, we just recently implemented something where I work and they we have a faculty member who's given half half of their teaching load release time to kind of spearhead professional development and I was like hey look at my study here's what I found and she said oh you know that's really interesting so we're offering a lot of different um, webinars on different facets of online teaching just kind of lunch and learn type things um, but again I think it really boils down to getting administration it seems like that you know obviously the higher up the chain you get the farther away from the classroom you get and I think you forget maybe what those struggles are yeah. uh, that educators go through and the you know the lack of you know or there's if you're not comfortable with pedagogy or constructivism which is kind of the yeah. predominant form in online education how that can affect your student outcomes but I think too it, it, it's more of a question of whether you know administrators want to settle settle for a general level of with these blanket, you know, type of professional development where everybody gets the same thing, or if they want to develop experts at different, you know, experience levels and pay attention to how many years of experience you have, what are the issues you identify that you like to work on instead of just constantly keep yeah. throwing this. Put everybody in the classroom and say, okay, here, here it is. Yeah, yeah. 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 Dr. Myers, a question. We have one webinar. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, oh, okay. I just wanted to kind of drag you back into the kind of statistical area a little bit. I think, um, I wonder if some of the findings that you're seeing in that um, younger age group with that wider um, standard deviation, was the size of that, that subgroup the same as 
the others because statistically nurses in general are a lot older so I would expect that your your sample would have been skewed toward that older age right. group. Yep. So, so if that's the case, I would expect that standard deviation to be larger just because well, were of there that. Like five or something? Yeah, there were five between <clears throat> 22 and 34. Yeah, so yeah. I guess that, to me, I guess I wouldn't make a lot no, of... No, that's right. Not a I wouldn't yeah. interpret too much into yeah. the, right. the larger standard deviation wow. with any of those and then that kind of brings me back to something you may want to speak of when you get to the point where you're publishing this and that's just like the the fact that you've got you know we've all been frustrated with the difficulty of getting the number of participants you want and the the response rate that you want and so the fact that you extended it you did everything right you worked on that recruiting all of that's the right stuff um, and you did multiple emails, and so everything you did there is right. I think what you just have to recognize is that because, and what may be something you want to identify, maybe even as, a, as um, an identified limitation, is that you didn't meet your power, and so because you were underpowered, there may be some relationships that were really there, yeah that you weren't able to identify just right. because you were underpowered in terms of your sample size. Sure. And so not through any fault of your own or the methodology no. or anything right. like that. It just wasn't big enough for me to see. It or just to wasn't big enough absolutely. for you to identify. Okay. And so I think if you just are, are transparent about that and make that clear, and then a larger sample size just solves that. So, um, you know, so then that just makes the, you know, you take the no significance findings with a little bit mm -hmm. more grain of salt, right? So that'd be right. my only thoughts there with getting back to the the basic math. Sure. I see. This is unfortunately this is how I was built, but you know, I, I think there's there's great opportunities for a, a good qualitative study to come out of this, especially when when you look at institutions that have. An instructional designer like I, I feel like we have a fantastic instructional designer here who you know the online faculty can chime in I mean if you guys have questions we have resources to go to so I mean you know I just think that that would be a good qualitative study you know look at the instructional design piece look at the professional development piece you know I mean, obviously you're you're not going to do it but at some point but down do. the road. <laughs> <laughs> Where I work, there, there are instructional designers, but nursing does not use them. We, Why? We build everything from, because we did that before because that's they how hired instructional designers. Yeah. So we just continued on our way. We had all of our courses developed already, so they didn't need to do anything. So, yeah. But it even goes, it goes beyond course development, though. I mean, and because we were hybrid, so we had four weeks online and four weeks in the classroom, it was kind of trial and error. When we started doing the whole online thing, um, yeah, there were no and we didn't design have instructional design yeah. at the time when we started doing online, and um, we just kind of done things and seen how they work, and then if that doesn't work, then we want to change it. And now, because our instructional designers are so busy, yeah. um, we have faculty coming to the nursing department asking for yeah. help. We're like, how do you how do this? Do you, <laughs> how, how did you create the course? <laughs> you know, you know, how did you, what were your, what did you do? Just, we you know, certainly be so open. Much. It's not that yeah. we preclude instruction. Sure. I know, no. but it just has never been an and, option. Yeah, and we don't yeah. tend to like take their job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no. I, trust that. I don't more, think any of us want No, I don't think so either. First thing, I would love to be an instructional designer. That would be very cool. <laughs> but some, some of it may be how online instruction is viewed, especially when you look at it in the context of health professions, in that, our enrollment is, is low, so let's just build some online courses and get a whole other population of students. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that that's a very generalized statement, but in some cases, that is how online instruction is, is viewed. It's, it's a, a revenue cow. drive, yeah. You yeah. can just quickly turn yeah. this face-to-face uh, -face course into an <clears throat> online course and get you know, 50 other students. So there may be different, online instruction may be valued. Yes, so, by different so people in different places. I have one question from webinar yes. that I want to ask. Um, the question is, can you explain how your topic evolved along the dissertation journey and was this your first topic? 
No, it was not. <laughs> so I changed topics about as many times as I changed clothes in a week. I mean, it just, it, it evolved. I, I know I had a, a really deep interest in educational technology and the, the effect, you know, perhaps generation age, you know, something along those lines. And so really uh, I started looking for generational differences in technology and technological affinity and that kind of thing. And so, but as I I did my literature review, I sort of evolved into like, well, here's what really exists. So, you know, here's a gap and I just went for it. So, but yes, the, I, gosh, I have a, a folder that says July and then final topic and there, well, you know, the July was like, like a year and a half. I mean, it, it, it evolved over the course of greater than a year. So it, it just morphed many times and you know, part of the process is you're supposed to let the literature tell you what's, you know, out there. <laughs> and it, you know, it did. It so. Did. Yeah. No and it's, I know you spend sometimes months looking for that one nugget, <laughs> that one little nugget that says, okay, this is it. I mean, I think all of us have been there. I mean, you just, you know, you're just, you're head, <laughs> heading down that path. And then all of a sudden it's like you, you reach that point where you get the epiphany or like, this is it. Yeah. So this one I'm gonna go for. It really was like sort of like <coughs> this is my thing. You know, I don't know. It's not very yeah, scientific, but <laughs> yeah, it's just, just something that you're really passionate about because you're gonna be with it. Very intimately acquainted with it for a long time. So you're gonna have to you're gonna have to like it. No, as I recently told you over email that I'm only about fifteen months out yes. from my own uh, dissertation. Um yeah, and it's it's hard to stay interested in what you're doing while I make other people interested <laughs> in it. Um, Jared stole my comment about sample size earlier, so I don't have a question. Um, but <laughs> I, I just want to say, we mentioned the arrogance of the of the younger professors. I'm not, fortunately, in the 25 to 34 age range anymore. But I will say, in my uh, two years on campus, I've taught 24 online classes, mm -hmm. um, and so I think you're going to get in the younger professor group, which is not young compared to the general population. I think some of that where they, you know, the so-called digital natives in an online sense where they come in on day one and they don't really, like, I may never teach an in-person class. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a foreign. Yeah, I don't have a, a, a strong comparison. And I happen to adjunct at UNI, so I haven't done it before, but I've done, you know, almost 10 to 1 online classes mm -hmm. versus in-person classes. Yeah. And I spend very little of my time in front of actual students. Um, and so I guess going forward uh, from a kind of a future perspective, I think you're going to see more people like me who really don't have a transition, who this is the normal way of teaching. Um, and, and I would say probably anybody with under five or 10 years of experience that this is just what they've done. Right. I mean, at, at minimum, they were hybrid for you know, paper submission, things like that on day one. They've never been handed a piece of paper right. from a student. And then we're gonna <laughs> so, so you know, and you think, okay, so what is that, you know, in, in five or ten years, what is that going to look like? Or we're going to be the other way. We're going to have to train instructors on soft skills and how to give a decent presentation. <laughs> this, this this study gets redone in ten years. That's what's the self-efficacy of, of a face-to-face -face lecture. I mean, I think that's. I mean, how would you rate yourself right now? Well, Fantastic, but I, I'm overcoming <laughs> all aspects of my life, so that's a bad question. Also, really sort of parallels the, the nursing profession and practice too. Yeah. I mean, there's yeah. going to be a huge mass exodus, and sort of we're left with novice nurses. That. But I mean, I think that slide you had, I think, it was research question one or two, the one that talked about the age. I mean, you know, when when you look at that, like from an administrative perspective, when you look at that, I mean, this this is very troubling because 67. We we have. 
a, a, an aging population of, of nurse educators, health professions, educators. And I mean, I think we're, when we're having this conversation 10 years from now, I mean, it, it, it's, it's alarming to know that, you know, and I think this is very reflective of, of what, what the population of nurse educators are, are you know. And for some of your population is retirement age. Right? Yeah. And, you know, is that reflective <clears throat> of the general population? Yeah. I, I would argue that that's, that's going to be pretty close. And Dr. Meyer made a great point that, you know, that, that 22 to 34 is a very, very small number right now. Right. But, but in a larger. <laughs> but how many nurse educators are we hiring that are, I mean, yeah, we get a few of them that are 30, 35 years old, but I mean, I, I mean, you see nurse educators that are in their early to mid twenties. I mean, it's you just don't have the you just don't have the experience. Well, I mean, because you're not qualified Actually, for the field until about 25, 26, regardless. Yeah. Before you have like, especially at a BSF level, you need master's degree prepared nurses. That population doesn't exist until they're mid twenties. You, know? you don't have twenty two year old MFS. Right. Well, no. But <laughs> we're going to have an eighteen year old BSF. It come December, so well, well, well but they, so she might be a 22 year old, <laughs> she probably will be. I mean, I'm in my 11th year of teaching and I'm 37, so I, you know, I started, mm -hmm. um, I, I just was able to sneak into a clinical arena and then that had an, I mean, it just sort of evolved over time, and so I, I can understand I, I'm one of those five. I mean, there are not many. Well, I mean, 34 still goes up, but that would be, I think, when most people are starting. Yeah, you know, yeah. I think that's just right. You can't be. I think you said in your comments, I like, can't be 35 with 20 years of experience. It's just not possible. Yeah, you yeah. just can't. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so that you know, is a confounding issue. But and again, those people who are 65 and older, well, they've been around the block, and so yeah, they've probably taught online classes maybe just one a year, but over time that can stretch right. out into a fair amount of efficacy. Um, no, no, I think that's just you look at like the Barb Cycles of the world, though. I mean. But, but you're, you're more of a rarity that you had a direct path in education. Most people don't. That's right. Especially, again, I'm not a nurse. She, she but what I've seen of my colleagues, they, they take a winding yeah. path through. They work on the floor for a few yeah. years. They go back for their master's. But part of the time, that takes three or four years. And then, yep. you know, by the time that they're kind of qualified and ready to do it, they're probably 34, 35. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. Well, we're at an hour, and I'm going to <laughs> it wasn't painful. I appreciate that. Emily, do you questions. have any other questions? She's good. Well, thank you so much for your time and attention. I appreciate it. I hope you found interest. I brought treats to my defense. I did not say treats. Oh, I have some tic tacs. <laughs> They're orange. Yeah, I guess I get some ice cream. There are some cookies in them. Well, that's that's just not the same. I think uh, I brought a cooler of like beverages for my friends. You could have brought. That, really, that's, that was standard at U and I. Okay, they're just like, oh yeah, you should bring like some drinks and some like bars or something for people. That's a nice thing if they're gonna come watch your defense. So <laughs> All right, so no, I didn't bring bush light. I brought like um, Lacroix, and yeah, bottle of water. Oh. <laughs> No, no, I'm sure. It was like, kind of, again, it was like 10 o'clock on weekday. Yeah. You told the restroom room, it's chill. Oh, yeah. If they had like, asked me, I think it would have been more of a mimosa type of event since it was in the morning. But, you know, cool. Yeah, I, I'm also, I saw you just had your 10 year anniversary. I looked it up. That's the aluminum anniversary. And I was like, well, obviously I know what I have to get Jared now. Switch line. No. <laughs> Summer Shandy. Summer Shandy. Can't. I don't know, a couple of those gives me gut wrong, just a little too I feel like two, and then I'm like, oh. Yeah.
this fall. Hopefully. So there may, be a defense, there may be a defense like that. Yeah, we've got three three more people working on defense. It should have at least one. Yeah, if there is, I mean, yeah. and I advertise them college-wide because I think it's important for the people to come and see the cross. Yeah, I would like to see more. I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for it. We just need to... Um, I did not bring it with me, but I can send it to you so that we can officially file it. But, um.